and welcome to a very special episode, episode 13, which I am recording on Friday the 13th, and there's some big harvest full moon or something like that as well, so all the stars have aligned. So um, what I'm going to do is, is release this today. I usually drop my podcast on Sunday, but what the hell? Why not? I alluded to something before when I was looking at the historical context of, of the Friday the 13th and, and slasher genre, what made it relevant and why the remakes have stumbled. And, and relevance is key. So with this cinema podcast today, I'm, I'm going back to something that I did a while ago and, and I wrote an open letter uh, to New Line Cinema uh, about the Friday the 13th franchise and and asking them to, to kind of take a, a stab, if you will, at something different. And uh, just so we all are up to speed, which we know, and that is, is the the Friday the Thirteenth franchise right now is in in legal hell. Uh, a number of parties are fighting back and forth over the rights. I'm not going to get into all of that, but the idea of um, a remake coming out to celebrate the 40th anniversary of of the franchise is in jeopardy from from all accounts. So we we don't know where that's going. However, let's just take that out of the equation for the moment and look at the situation as it is. And, and that is what I discussed in the previous broadcast uh, about the relevancy of, of the slasher genre and, and Friday the 13th and even Nightmare on Elm Street. And things have changed since the 1980s, and uh, especially in the way of, of, of sexual mores and, and attitudes towards sex by teenagers. Uh, a lot's changed, whether you want to bring in the AIDS epidemic and other diseases which which have come into play and, and really given pause for a lot of people from just having that that uh, wild abandoned unprotected sex at a summer camp um, all the way through to to the political and, and technological landscapes which have transformed us I mean social media alone has made a major impact in the dating scene and, and how we hook up how we get together uh, whether you know, you can take that in a conservative bent or you can look over at, at other you know social media platforms that just promote uh, hookups things have changed and so have the genres or, or I should say have the franchises, adapted to these kind of changes. So so what can be done? I mean, we're, we're seeing things like, for example, um, The Dark Crystal at this point in time now has a prequel series on Netflix. Is, is Friday the 13th or even Nightmare on Elm Street series material? And uh, by that, a lot of it that we're talking about also comes from um, you know providing all these elaborate backgrounds to things. And uh, we're going to get into that again as well, too. I, I don't know if Jason Voorhees needs such an elaborate backstory. And and definitely, I don't know if Freddy Krueger does either. And the same with Michael Myers. Uh, part of the mystique and the terror of, of these figures was their mystery and, and their randomness of things as well, too. They, they were almost forces of nature rather than humanoid figures. And, and I always equated Michael Myers, for example, with, with a tornado. And that is in the original 1978 Halloween, uh, it seemed that Michael almost picked his, his victims randomly or arbitrarily. Uh, yeah, he had a focus on Jamie Lee Curtis at the end, but it was the sequels that, that really went to you know extremes with the whole brother-sister thing, which wisely the, the recent Halloween dumped to the side and got rid of, of that whole thing. Uh, I'm not a fan of 1981's uh, Halloween 2, and I think it also exemplifies cinema uh, simply because Halloween 2 is is a sequel that gets a lot of love from the fan base simply because the major characters returned. Uh, in fact, uh, Halloween 2 is just nothing but a retread. It, it's, it's everything that the original Halloween tried not to be. And uh, as Tommy Lee Wallace himself even said, it was the anti-Halloween. Uh, but I'm going off on a different track there. So, so to bring this back to these franchises and relevancy, um, I, I wrote an open letter to New Line Cinema, which, of course, nobody paid any attention to. One of the most important things in this open letter that I expressed to New Line Cinema was the fact, to make this work, it's got to be Corey Feldman who plays Tommy Jarvis. And I say this because a lot of these reboots, remakes, reimaginings, repackagings that, that I've discussed in uh, episode, I believe it was episode eight of uh, my cinema podcast, um, they rely on nostalgia. Nostalgia is their greatest fuel. And so we're going to get into, I'm going to support why this must be Corey Feldman to play Tommy. Even though a number of other people have played Tommy Jarvis 
it's Corey Feldman who is instantly identified with the role. However, at the risk of shooting myself in the foot and giving away my thoughts here on, on this whole thing th that could easily just be stolen, here's my proposal to get Jason out of development hell and, and give the franchise a much needed shot in the arm. And look at the mess that was made uh, with with Freddy versus Jason just to get the rights to to those two characters. I mean, Jason X was made to keep Friday the 13th relevant while the rights for Freddy versus Jason were hashed out. And and that made sense in theory, but the execution was poor. And, and while Freddy versus Jason finally made it to the big screen, I mean, the reception was kind of tepid and it definitely didn't spawn a new series. Whenever I hear people go, oh, it was awesome and it made a lot of money. It was great. It was a huge success. My, my answer is always back. And that is, so where's the next one? Reboots of both Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street underperformed. And, and we know that, especially the Nightmare on Elm Street one. And, and it just failed to ignite the excitement needed to launch a whole new franchise. And again, that goes back to historical context. No one's looking at trying to make these franchises relevant again to a brand new, all different, and much more sophisticated audience. A little under a year ago, I think it was, maybe a little longer now, news leaked that there was going to be another Friday the 13th, and uh, some said it was going to be found footage, and then there was another one that, that ballyhooed, uh, you know, Jason in snow, whatever that means. And, and really, it's a lot of people just talking a lot of shit to, to get some clicks and get something in an article so, so people will look at it. I remember hearing that there, there might be another Friday the 13th, like, you know, a stab at, at another reboot or a remake where Jason wouldn't even be in it. And then another Nightmare reboot was recently announced. And again, I don't know how real all these stories are. And, and it seems that these things move forward with all the requisite misinformation. I, I just, a lot of people talk a lot of shit online. And, and there really is no official word on Friday the 13th as of yet, nor is there any official word on A Nightmare on Elm Street. And I would love to have a crack at either of them. Are these two franchises, Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th, are they relevant any longer? So let's take a look. I mean, at their core is 80s sexploitation, and, and that decade is long gone. I mean, things are different now. As, as I said, things have changed in 30 years. Horror has changed. I mean, one film was a Halloween ripoff, Friday the 13th, and the other an inventive low-budget feature that failed in its initial box office run as the slasher craze had peaked. I remember seeing A Nightmare on Elm Street, the original Wes Craven classic, in an almost empty theater. I mean, things are very different since those films came out. The, the political, social, and economic climate has changed. So what can be done about it? I mean, are both Jason and Freddy now the equivalent of, of the Frankenstein monster and, and Wolfman and Dracula and what they all became by the time, you know, Abbott and Costello rolled around? I mean, Freddy versus Jason and Frankenstein meets the Wolfman were, were exactly 60 years apart. So things kind of came full circle. You, you took your once venerated scary icons and you kind of turned them into a, a wrestling kind of goofy comic matchup. That's what I tried to avoid with Death House. I, I did not want Death House to be a stupid monster mashup. And when it was first pitched to me, I thought it was going to be a Freddy versus Jason kind of thing. And for a moment, I thought they'd actually secured money and, and the legal ability to, to get Jason Voorhees and Candyman and Freddy Krueger. And, and I remember sitting at a, at a table in Los Angeles going, I, I don't want to make that kind of movie. And the reason is simple. It's stupid. You're taking a, a lowest common denominator type of filmmaking and putting it out there. It's the low hanging fruit, folks. It's, it's not hard to make those kind of movies. So I wanted Death House to, to be something smarter. And so did Gunnar Hansen. And we worked like hell to fashion what we have now, which some people have said, you know, oh, Death House is a little confusing. Good. Then watch it again. It's about audience interpretation. It's not about spoon feeding this horror down your throat like foie gras and, and you're, or those, those poor bastards in, in the garden in Motel Hell. You're, you're supposed to think. You're actually supposed to apply historical and, and cultural concepts and religious concepts. I know you're not supposed to actually have to think when watching a movie which I call bullshit. So after the 80s, I mean, a lot happened to the American teenagers since, since Ronald Reagan rode off into the sunset. I mean, the 80s, as I said in, in my previous episodes, were this weird concoction of conservative and liberal and, and that whole have sex and die motif worked for those films back 
then you could have liberal heaps of sex and that could be shown on screen, but as long as there were consequences. And, and in the end, those consequences were simple. It was death. The 1990s brought us real monsters. Columbine, the rise of domestic and foreign terrorism that, that culminated in the Oklahoma City and 9-11 attacks. Social media brought its own horrors and, and teenagers were more afraid of each other than a machete-wielding hockey mask killer and a burn victim with a knife-tipped glove. We walk into movie theaters more afraid of the actual human that may walk through the door with an automatic weapon than we are of the monster on the screen. We're more worried about sending our kids to fucking school and worried about some jackass shooting up the school than we are about any of the monsters that we watch on Netflix or, or Freddy Krueger. In fact, Krueger and Jason Voorhees are kind of pretty laughable compared to the real life horrors that we've had since the 1990s. By 2003, Freddy and Jason, they, they seem like old fashioned villains to a generation wanting designer horror and, and facing real horrors in their school hallways. The horrors changed, but the thinking behind horror films did not, and that's part of the problem. All right, Harrison, well, well cinema just seems like one big bitch fest and all you do is complain. No, I'm sorry, if, if you think that, then you haven't listened to a thing I've said since episode one. That's not the point of, of cinema, my blog or, or my cinema podcast. So uh, another thing to, to remedy this is to offer up, well, Harrison, if you're so fucking smart, how do we fix it? Stop recycling the same old stuff and put to good use the assets that you already own, New Line Cinema. And number one, bring back Corey Feldman. There are only three memorable characters from the entire Friday the 13th franchise, and, and I challenge anybody. I mean, you can bring up some obscure character, but I'm telling you right now that the holy trinity of Friday the 13th is Pamela Voorhees, her son Jason, and Tommy fucking Jarvis. Anyone else is simply part of a victim menu in this series. You want Jason versus Crazy Ralph? No, and I don't think anyone's clamoring right now for a Crazy Ralph origin story. Corey Feldman originated Tommy in 1984's The Final Chapter, and the film was naturally overloaded with the traditional two-dimensional characters in these films, which serve no purpose other than to die in a variety of cool ways to make us scream and shout and, and all that fun stuff and eat our popcorn in the theater. But there was something about Feldman's performance that shaded Tommy and made the young boy far more real than the dozens of victims around him in that film. And while his character was severely underwritten, did he actually create all those elaborate masks? Did he buy them? Was he a collector? Did he know of Jason's previous exploits and, and did he study them? Was, was Tommy some kind of like serial killer researcher, uh, a cryptos, you know, cryptoid you know, kind of researcher as well, a cryptozoologist? I mean, does Jason fall under that kind of category at that time? I mean, Jason is kind of uh, the Loch Ness Monster in urban legend meets John Wayne Gacy kind of thing. Audiences took to Tommy Jarvis and Jason had himself a formidable nemesis. And aside from that brief cameo in the fifth film, Feldman's character was eventually shopped out and played by another actor, which was a mistake. Now, to be clear, I worked with Corey Feldman on my film Six Degrees of Hell, which I wrote and produced. However, that has nothing to do with this podcast. Whether I know Corey or not, or consider him a friend or not, is not it. I'm endorsing Corey Feldman simply for the fact that he originated this character and he was the best one and he would bring people back to the theater just to see this 1984 reunion. Now the final chapter was a sincere effort to send the series out with a bang as its opening titles even suggested. You remember that? The, the mask, the hockey mask comes flying in and then it explodes with what I swear is some stock uh, explosion sound effect that 50s movies and cartoons used to use. Then the film rang up ticket sales, and I remember that because I was an usher at the uh, mall cinema when this was going on, and that movie didn't stop. It cranked, and I remember people screaming. I remember standing in the back and listening to people screaming, especially at that ending between Tom Savini's makeup effects, Corey Feldman shaving his head and coming down the steps. People were going nuts. The franchise was given a stay of execution and, and part five was supposed to take the series in a new direction and, and we know how that turned out, kind of like what Halloween 3 was supposed to do, but there are two different set of circumstances there and we'll be talking about Halloween 3 as we get closer to the holiday. Two mistakes were no Corey Feldman and no Jason Voorhees in part five. 
And apparently Paramount never did get the memo on the whole Halloween 3 debacle. So Jason Lives, like the return of Michael Myers, attempted to fix the missteps of their previous installments. And they brought back the fan favorite characters, but they didn't update their relevance. Both films offered the same old plots. Jason Lives injected meta humor and, and cornball comedy, that, that paintball stuff, man, it, it's still really lame in my opinion. But the real issue was no Corey Feldman. Feldman was busy being a star at that time, but Feldman's absence was like replacing Jodie Foster's Clarice Starling with Julianne Moore. You're looking at the screen going, oh, who is that up on the screen that isn't Corey Feldman? Corey Feldman killed Jason. He's the only one to have truly done so. He's the only one who could launch a Tommy vs. Jason series. Feldman has a solid fan base, and he has an entire 80s generation of filmgoers that would embrace his return to the character. However, this is still not enough, but it's the first step, and in my opinion, it's a good one. It's the movie I would make. So let's look at reinventing for relevance. So Tommy is a haunted character, right? Something dark was already driving him. Maybe he was obsessed with all these dark things and monster masks and, and, and all of this stuff. And his attack on Jason at the conclusion of part four is brutal and methodical. He outfoxed the mute killer and was one step ahead of him, preventing his resurrection and protecting his sister. So we pick up decades later with Tommy Jarvis in a different world. So follow me here. And he's haunted by the ghosts of his past. And he is obsessed in his steadfast belief that Jason Voorhees never perished, that somehow he survived. In essence, ignore all the films past part four, like Halloween H2O. The new Halloween 2018 totally ignores Halloween 2 from 1981 all the way out through, even including the two other films involving Jamie Lee Curtis. They're all ignored and wisely so. The only one that mattered was Halloween 1978. So we go all the way up to part four in this Tommy versus Jason movie, and we ignore everything afterwards. This isn't all about hunting Jason. This is about exploring Tommy and his world. What has become of this kid since that night in the cabin? This is a world now populated with ghost hunters and Bigfoot truthers and conspiracies and, and all that garbage. UFOs are no longer subjects from the fringe. So where did Tommy land in the aftermath of that massacre in 1984? He confronted Jason Voorhees face to face and he won. And what kind of man has Tommy Jarvis become? This is where Jason Lives dropped the ball, man. There was a solid chance to reinvent the franchise and make Jarvis a kind of like supernatural James Bond or maybe even Indiana Jones. Instead, we got a generic guy screaming to be believed against a backdrop of corny jokes and an Alice Cooper song. In other words, Make Tommy versus Jason the casino royale of the fucking franchise. Bring the series back to dark, gritty roots. Make Tommy brutal and insatiable for the truth. He's anti-establishment. He doesn't trust the law or people and likely finds a conspiracy in every shadow. But it doesn't mean he's crazy. He's still a kid at heart and he's holding his shit together, just barely. However, he's dedicated to changing his world or at least controlling it. That sounds like a present generation that often feels lost or not a part of what came before it and no idea where it's going. Now you make the goddamn series relevant to a whole new generation. You make them identify with the franchise, not through the killer, but through Tommy Jarvis. Tommy is a rogue in a world that no longer finds the Crystal Lake killings anything more than a footnote on Wikipedia. But Tommy was there. He lost his mother. Maybe his sister has died since. He's alone in a world that has totally moved on and you embrace that change and that would make things work. When Pierce Brosnan took over the role as James Bond, Judi Dench's M called James Bond a misogynistic dinosaur in that Bond update. Jason could be called the same. We need a monster for a new self-absorbed generation that believes it's above society's conventions. Sometimes this generation is arrogant and finds Jason a joke. What happened to Crystal Lake happened a long time ago and none of that matters because it's old. Tommy Jarvis is the bridge between the old world and the new one. He knows the deal 
and he fights the politically correct comatose society around him to get at the cancer that is growing and poses a threat to us all. Now, I understand there is an underground Tommy versus Jason graphic novel out there. I've never seen it, but I've, I've heard tell of it. Make this a Comic-Con launch concept. Turn Tommy into an anti-hero and revent him Frank Miller Dark Knight style or Killing Joke style. I am willing to bet these artists are fans of Corey Feldman's and they have approached him at some point. Jason has appeared in a number of video games and recently a character in, in, in the popular PlayStation 1. Get a new game on Tommy vs. Jason. Bring back characters from the previous films and design this along the lines of Max Payne meets Resident Evil. Now you make the franchise relevant. And if this doesn't work for a feature film franchise, then think about it as a TV series, a limited TV series. They seem to be working and Netflix is buying content. And now you have Apple Plus and all this other stuff. Somebody has to be interested in this. I mean, there's been word that Jason was getting his own TV show. Again, that could all be bullshit. Horror has found a new home on television. Much like good drama has, it's all going back to the small screen. The big screen is cluttered with huge franchises, and if it isn't a fucking superhero movie, nobody wants to talk to you. Package up Tommy vs. Jason. Make it a TV show that could mean something to a present generation. Cross-pollinate and make this something that could run supplemental to the Friday the 13th franchise that already exists. These are my points for generating a lot of cash. You create a spinoff without the stigma of a remake. You bring back a fan favorite and one of the top three characters in over 10 motion pictures. You avoid the stigma of recycling old plots and diluting the horror aspect of the film. You don't go satire, you don't go comedy. The series becomes relevant to an entirely new generation of viewers who have only heard of Jason Voorhees from their parents or maybe even as a reference in Family Guy. That's my open letter to New Line Cinema. And I know it's a legal mess out there. For Friday the 13th, I hope you found this entertaining. And my best to Corey Feldman, if he's listening. Tune in again next week. Thanks for your time. And enjoy your Friday the 13th weekend. Head on over to iTunes and give me a like and review. And if you want to read my cinema blog, you'll find it at horrorfuel.com forward slash author forward slash Harrison.